in November of this year, I started reading a book about the Incarnation. And I can tell you it's been a fabulous book. It has been so rich and uh, encouraging. It's challenged me to, to look more deeply into a doctrine that so often is overlooked and undervalued. And this morning, uh, may, there may be some of you that are unfamiliar with the term incarnation. Webster's defines it uh, as the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus Christ. It's the idea that Jesus is fully God and fully man. We read about uh, the incarnation in John chapter 1, where it talks about it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in Hebrews chapter 1, which will be our primary text this morning, the author of Hebrews says it this way, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so this morning, I'd like for us to, to very quickly look at seven ways that the incarnation reveals the glory of God. And I hope that that even though this will be a relatively quick overview, that it might whet your appetite, that it might encourage you to spend some more time as well looking at the incarnation and, and meditating on what it means for Jesus to be who he is. But this morning, before we start, would you join me again for a word of prayer? Father, as we come to you this morning, I am so very aware of my inability I don't have words that can capture the beauty of Christ. I don't have a way to convey the, the excitement, the delight that we should have in who Jesus is. But Father, we know that you, by your Spirit, can help us to see Christ in his glory. That you can help us behold Jesus and to have our hearts drawn to him as they should be, that you can give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And so this morning, Lord, we pray that that is what you would do, that your spirit would come and, and make up for my inability as a speaker and as our inability as listeners, and that through your spirit, we would gain a glimpse of the glory of Christ. And that this morning, we would find ourselves more delighted by him, more drawn to him, more in love with him, captivated by his glory. And that through this all, you would be exalted and lifted up as we are changed more and more into the image of your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the first thing I'd like us to look at is the fact that God spoke to us by his son. You remember Hebrews chapter 1 begins this way. It says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now the very fact that God desires to speak to us should leave us dumbfounded. Really, it should leave us overwhelmed, humbled. We should be eager to hear. We should be longing to listen. But unfortunately, it's not always that way, is it? Far too often we respond the same way that Adam and Eve did once they sinned. We withdraw, we hide ourselves from God. Or, or maybe even in considering how the Israelites responded when God gave them the Ten Commandments. You, you remember, it talks about now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. 
and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. God desires to speak to us, but fortunately for us, he is also aware of how fragile and fearful we are as creatures. And so, even though God has spoken in many times and in many ways through the prophets, we see the fullest of God speaking to us in Christ. And and consider what it says in John chapter 12. Jesus speaking says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak, And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. You see, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. And and think about that. God, God, taking on flesh and blood, Jesus, fully God, fully man, comes and speaks the word of God. And, And think about what you know, how he comes and he speaks God's word to the broken to the sinners, to the outcasts, to the children, right? He comes and speaks to us face to face. We see Jesus touching the untouchable. We see him embracing them, taking them onto his lap. And what a glorious picture it is of how God has chosen to speak to us through his Son. So the first thing we see in the incarnation is that Through Jesus, God's speaking to us. And in Jesus, God is speaking to us the clearest that we will ever hear in this lifetime. Now, consider the second thing that it says here. Not only is God speaking to us, but it also tells us that he was appointed the heir of all things. He was appointed the heir of all things. Now, of course, God the Son in his divinity has always had all authority. But it's very interesting that as God takes on flesh, as Jesus comes, the incarnate one, it says he was appointed the heir of all things. You see, Jesus comes and regains what Adam lost, what Adam surrendered in his rebellion against God. Look at what it says here in Luke chapter 4, when the devil is tempting Jesus It says, starting in verse 5, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. But, Look at what it says in John chapter 12 as Jesus is headed to the cross and he says, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered, and others said an angel had spoken to him. But Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. You see, Jesus, by his life and death, is appointed the heir of all things. All authority is given to him. He holds all authority in his hands. And that is very good news for us. And we could talk about so many ways that we are blessed by the fact that Jesus, as the Son of God, fully God and fully man, is appointed the heir of all things. But I want us to look at two. I want us to look at two just briefly. The first we see in Matthew chapter 11 verses 27 through 30, and Jesus speaking says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
You see, because Jesus has been appointed the heir of all things, we are invited to come. We're invited to come and find rest for our souls. But did you notice that the rest we're invited to enjoy is all connected to us knowing who the Father really is and that only Jesus can reveal him to us? You see, there's no way for us or anyone to know the Father except through Jesus. Now, now think about that personally. What that means for us is if we want to be in relationship with the Father, we need to pursue Christ. We need to press into him. We can only do that through being united with Christ and faith. Now, I want to also just point out here when, when we see Jesus saying that he can reveal the Father to us, that that's not saying Jesus is going to tell us information about the Father. You see, far too often, I believe, we settle for just knowing about the Father. But what Jesus is talking about here in this passage is bringing us into an experiential relationship with the Father. That we would know the Father as He knows the Father. The second thing that this means for us is as we are trying to see other people come and start a relationship with the Father, we have to take them to Jesus. You see, far too often we think if we can just get them to church or if we can just you know, get them to change their behavior or if we can get them to pray a prayer or if we can just get them baptized, then they'll be in relationship with the Father. But that's not what this says. What this says is that only Jesus can reveal the Father to them. Only Jesus can bring them into relationship with the Father. And so our primary goal is to continually seek to bring the people in our lives to Christ. Continually bring them to Christ. Continually bring them to Christ. Because as the heir of all things, he is their only hope. He's the only one. So because Jesus has been appointed the heir of all things, we're invited to come. But that's not all. Also, we are empowered to go. Look at this very familiar passage. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. The Great Commission, I know mostly you will be familiar with this. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, because Jesus has been appointed the heir of all things, because all authority has been given to him, we can be confident in knowing that the gospel will be successful. And that as we seek to take the gospel to the lost around us, whether that's in our families or our communities and our workplaces, or if it's taking the gospel to the hardest places in the world, because Jesus is the heir of all things, we can be confident the gospel will be successful. And so we can have the courage to go. We can be empowered to be faithful to carry this out. So with Jesus as the heir of all things, we're invited to come, but we're also empowered to go. Let's look at the third thing. Not only has he spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, but it was through whom also he created the world. Through whom also he created the world. You see, the very power of creation is evident in Jesus' life. Look at, look at this brief list. We're going to just skip through this. You'll know all of this, but the ways we see the power of creation evident in Jesus' life, we see Jesus command the wind and the waves. We see him, uh, really, all of nature obeying him. We see Jesus take the five loaves and the two fish and use that to feed 5,000, thousands of people, 5,000 men with baskets left over the power of creation at work in his life. We see Jesus heal a man born blind, as well as we we see him healing those who are deaf, who are mute, those who are lame, those with leprosy, all types of illnesses, the power of creation at work in Jesus' life. We also see Jesus raising the dead, the power of 
creation at work in Jesus' life. But I think possibly the most significant thing for us in the fact that creation, the power of creation is at work in Christ, the God-man, is found in John chapter 5. It says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. The power of creation at work in Christ, the Son of God. And so not only are we invited by him into relationship with the Father, but he has the ability to give us new life, eternal life. Look at the fourth thing. The next thing we see the author of Hebrews tell us is that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. The radiance of the glory of God. Now the image that we have here is of trying to look at the sun and see all of the brilliance and all of the brightness, all of the rays of the sun. It's the picture that we have here that in Jesus, all of the attributes, all of the glory of God is shining forth. You know, it, it's interesting because I, in my study on the incarnation, I came to a realization. I realized I kind of had this view that Jesus was the cliff notes versions of God. You, you guys know what cliff notes are? You know, like the, the little summary version, right? He, he, he's kind of like, you know, gives a sort of an overview of God. But, but in studying this, I realized all of the attributes of God are evident in Christ. He is truly the radiance of God's glory. We see God's holiness, God's love, God's power, God's wisdom, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, kindness, patience, beauty, strength. Every attribute of God is evident in Jesus. I mean, how glorious is it to consider? I mean, think about this, okay? Do you remember? You, surely you probably do remember, but if not, I'm going to read it to you. So you remember how Moses begged to see God's glory? You remember it says in Exodus 33, Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, God said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. Now, consider that and consider the difference that we see in Jesus. You remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then you remember Philip's question, right? In John 14, 8, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, Show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. What a glorious difference. You see, no man could look on the face of God and live until God took on the face of man. And so in Christ, we see all of the radiance of God's glory. But the author of Hebrews doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. He's the exact imprint of of God's nature. It's almost as if he wants to be sure we don't make the mistake 
of thinking that Jesus is a reflection of God's glory. You see, Jesus is not a reflection of God's glory. He's the radiance of God's glory because he is the exact imprint of his nature. The idea here is that Jesus is the same substance, the the same material, the same essence, the same nature. There's no division or distinction between the nature of God the Father and God the Son. Colossians 1.19 says it like this, For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And Charles Spurgeon says it this way, Whatever God is, Christ is. The very likeness of God, the very Godhead of God, the very deity of deity is in Christ Jesus. You see, as we look at Jesus' life, everything that we see about him shows us the very nature of God. When we see Jesus forgive, we're watching God forgive. When we see Jesus love, we're watching God love. When we see Jesus anger, we're watching God's anger. When we see Jesus kindness, we're watching God's kindness. That overall, as we look at Jesus' life, We're observing the holiness of God being lived out before our eyes. In addition to all of these things, the author of Hebrew tells us Jesus, God the Son, upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So in addition to possessing the power of creation, the author is sharing with us this idea that Jesus is actively ruling and sustaining all of creation. You see, every breath that you take is given by the word of his power. All of the stars maintain their place in the sky. All of the planets, their orbits by the word of his power. All of the molecular bonds in every atom are sustained by the word of his power. Everything around us is an evidence of God at work, Jesus ruling and sustaining all things. You know, the, the mindset is easy for us to get into of thinking that God did all of these things in the past and now he's just kind of waiting things out. But that's not the picture that we have here. Jesus is the Son of God, is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's reigning, he's ruling, he's sustaining, he's actively involved in every part of creation, every moment of every day. In 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6, it says it this way. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The last phrase that we're going to look at this morning is at the end of verse 3. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there are so many ways that the incarnation intersects with and impacts Jesus making purification for sins that the book of Hebrews talks about extensively. We could could spend hours, weeks, days, this whole year talking about this very thing. But just for the sake of time this morning, I'd like to look at two, two passages that we see here in Hebrews. The first is in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he being Jesus, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that is, flesh and blood, 
that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to make purification for sins. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now the truth is, even just looking at these verses, we could spend hours talking about how the incarnation, how Jesus coming as fully God and fully man impact the work that he's done in making purification for sins. But just to summarize this, it says that Jesus had to be made like us in every respect. He had to take on flesh and blood in order to make purification for sins. I want to to just have you consider something with me. It's something that I have been pondering as I've been studying the incarnation. Think about this for a minute. As we look at Jesus, as we look at his life, he was constantly at work purifying those around him. Okay? Now, you remember Pastor Andrew's sermon last week, and if you didn't hear it or watch it, I would encourage you to go back and do it. It was great. It was on how Jesus is the Holy One of God and looking at God's holiness in Christ. Now, think about holiness in our lives, though. Okay? Think about how much you and I have to work. We have to labor to try to protect and preserve our purity and holiness. Right? Matter of fact, if we look at God's Word, the, the truth is, Much of the Bible, especially the first five books of the Bible, are devoted to helping us know how we can avoid uncleanness. And and that might be ceremonial uncleanness, right? Like from things like skin diseases or discharges of bodily fluids like blood or touching something that's dead or eating unclean foods or even being touched by someone who is unclean. Right? And there's rules after rules and pages after pages to help us to try and preserve our cleanness. Right? But it's not just that. Right? The Bible continually talks to us about the sins that make us spiritually unclean. I mean, pages after pages, you read it and you look at your life and it's like a magnifying glass showing you the areas of sin. Now, the underlying message in it all is that we must labor to preserve our cleanness or to avoid uncleanness. Because if we encounter uncleanness or if we are, 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 are touched by uncleanness or if we embrace uncleanness, then we become unclean. Okay, you guys with me so far? I know this is a rabbit trail. It's good. It's worth it. Stay with me. Okay? But when we look at Jesus' life, his life doesn't function that way. Right? When we see Jesus, when he encounters things that are unclean, whether it's lepers or or the woman with the issue of blood or even dead bodies, they don't make Jesus unclean. Right? What happens is Jesus' touch makes them clean. I mean, think about that. The impurities don't taint Jesus. Jesus' holiness burns away the impurity. Whether that's by healing the lepers or other illnesses, whether that's by casting out demons, whether it's by raising the dead or even by forgiving sins. What we see time and time again in all of Jesus' life is that his holiness radiates out making the unclean clean. And the ultimate act, of course, we see is in Jesus' death, where he takes our sin, where he takes the wrath that we deserve, and he takes it upon himself. But even in that, what happens? He bears it all, but in the end, his holiness purifies it. His death 
makes purification for sin. We get righteousness. But in the end, Jesus isn't unpure. In the end, Jesus' holiness shines through. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. It says, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Isn't that good? By a single offering, he's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus' death makes purification for sins. And in faith, we are joined with him in that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus made purification for our sins. But the important question for you to ask yourself this morning is this. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Can you say with Paul what he says in Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live. In the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you in Christ? Have you been united by faith to Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection? Are you in Christ? Have you experienced this? If you haven't, it can change today. This morning, today can be the time when you are made new in Christ. And I would love to talk to you about that. If you're here afterwards, please come find me. I'd love to talk to you about how you can find new life in Christ. If you're watching our live stream, I would encourage you, please just take time to contact us. You can, you can text the church's phone number, go on our website, you can email us, you can contact us. But please, if you don't know Jesus, give me the opportunity to share him with you. Now, if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, how should these truths impact how you live? How should dealing with Jesus as the incarnation, fully God, fully man, as we know him more, as we experience what he's done on our behalf, how should it impact how we live? We're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest 
over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So five things. Five things that we can see here in this passage that should flow out of our lives as we experience the truth of the incarnation, as we understand who Christ is and what he's done. First, let us draw near to Jesus. Let us draw near to Jesus. If you experience Christ, if you come to see the incarnation, even with a glimpse of the beauty that it possesses in what it means for God to come as man, Your heart should be drawn to Christ, right? Notice that it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. The more we see of Jesus, the stronger our faith becomes. The more we're drawn to be near him, the more we long for him, the more we realize that he is the central figure of all of history. Everything revolves around Christ. Let us draw near to Jesus. The second thing, let us hold fast our hope in Christ. Let us hold fast our hope in Christ. Not only should we be drawn to him, but our hope should be set in him. It says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see, as we see Christ and we see in him all of the incarnation, being fully God and fully man, we're assured of Christ's winning. We know that his goals, his plan, his rule is going to come to fruition. So no matter what happens around us, or even what's happening within us, our hope is not set here, but it's set on him. Let us hold fast our hope in Christ. The third thing we see Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. As we realize who Christ is and what Christ has done, it should motivate us to be like him. And not only to be like him, but to desire that in one another. The idea in this verse here is that you're giving intentional thought and planning to how you can help your brothers and sisters in Christ love like Christ loved. And serve like Christ served. The idea is that as the world looks on us and sees us love like this, as they see our good works, that it's so good that they're taken back. They're overwhelmed when they see us love like Christ and they see us carrying out the good works that Christ does. They should be amazed at that kind of goodness. The fourth thing we see is let us not neglect to meet together. Wow, what a challenging thing this year, right? You know, here we are in the midst of all of this, and the truth is we're still called to meet together. Now, we're challenged, whether that's because of concern for our health or governmental mandates, whether it's limiting the size of our groups and where we meet and when we meet. There's so many barriers that we've had to deal with this year. But yet when we experience Christ for who he is and understand what Christ has done, we're still compelled to gather together in worship. And what does that look like? whether it's coming, whether it's gathering together on Zoom, whether it's getting a few people together in your house, whether it's having neighbors over, whatever it is, we are committed to pursuing Christ together. And we have to take responsibility for that. We have to take initiative to see that we continue to meet together. The last thing we see here, let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
I don't know about you, but I can assure you this is a year where I need encouragement. Okay? I'm just, I'm just going to be honest with you. Somebody's mad at me every week. Right? People are mad because we're wearing masks. People are mad because we're not wearing masks. People are mad because we're having too many services. People are mad we're not having enough services. People are mad that we're contacting them all the time. Other people are mad we're not contacting them enough. I mean, doing ministry this year has been hard, right? And the truth is, I know that you feel the same challenges, right? Your life might be different than my life, but it's been a crazy year. I'm pretty sure none of us would say Christmas was just like normal, right? It's been a challenging year, and we need the encouragement. But you see, when we experience Christ, when we understand Christ coming as God and man, as we understand what Christ has done, the natural outflowing of that should be for us to seek to encourage one another. And as the challenges grow, our encouragement grows. As we face bigger problems, our commitment to encourage one another grows, and we seek to find ways to intentionally help each other through these things so that Christ will be glorified in us. So there you have it. With two minutes to spare, according to the back clock. You know what? As, as we come through a crazy year, I know that this is just such a quick overview of seven things that we see in the Incarnation. And I know I'm just scratching the surface, but my, my hope, my desire in this is just to whet your appetite and to tell you, you should be more excited about the incarnation than you are. You should spend more time, invest more effort in understanding what God has done coming fully God and fully man. And I can tell you this year that I am personally going to continue pursuing this. I actually have a book that I haven't finished. And I have another book lined up along the same thing. Let me encourage you, pursue Christ. Pursue seeing him in all his glory. Be captured by the glory of God. And together, let's press on that we might make much of him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you do not leave us to ourselves. We thank you that you do come to speak to us, that you speak through your Son. Father, forgive us for all the times we take that for granted. And give us a passion for his glory, that we might long to know you, that we might long to hear you, that we might long to see you, that we would press in to be near you. Father, thank you for all that Christ has done, especially in purifying us from our sins. Lord, let us delight in who he is and that we are yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys have a great day.